Hello, I'm Darren McGee and today's question asks if I would discuss the enabler or more specifically the enabling parent in a narcissistic family. Now if you like this video, if you find it helpful, please consider subscribing to my channel for future updates on mental health related topics. But just as a reminder, this video is not a substitute for support from a mental health professional nor is it a tool to be used to diagnose someone. Now when it comes to narcissism, now I've outlined different kinds of narcissism before. The most common types being the grandiose or the overt narcissist or the vulnerable, the covert narcissist. Narcissism can also be present where there's other things going on like an addiction or another kind of disorder or mental health problem. Sometimes it can be very deeply ingrained behavioral traits. But because narcissists are generally very dependent on others uh, for their self-assurance, for their self-esteem, where there is a narcissist, not necessarily one who's thriving, but one who's getting away with behaving the way they do, it's generally because there is an enabler. Now, they enable the narcissist's controlling and abusive behavior. They enable that inflated persona and that sense of entitlement. And there can be enablers in the workplace, uh, in organizations, at clubs, community groups. Um, but for today, I'm just gonna be discussing the dynamics in a family relationship. Now, there are different kinds of enabler. We're gonna be looking at the different kinds, the way they behave, the beliefs, and we're gonna be looking as well at some of the common phrases that enablers use. Now, as I've outlined in previous videos, in narcissistic families, everybody has a role to play. They tend to operate like a cult. Now, from the narcissist themselves, sometimes referred to as the matriarch or the patriarch, the way I look at them sometimes, the grand worshipful master, or she who must be obeyed. All the other family members have roles as well, golden child, scapegoat and so on, and there's also enabler. Now more often than not, though not in every single case, more often than not the enabler is the other parent, it's the partner. Now there could be differences in how they enable. Um, the enabler could be either the mother or the father. The enabler could be in a same sex relationship. But what I'm looking at today is where there are two parents and there are children involved. There's that family dynamic. So what does an enabler look like? Well, there are different ways to identify them. For example, whether it's intentionally or not, maybe the enabler doesn't stand up for themselves. They, they lack assertiveness. They, they don't stand up for themselves. They don't stand up for the kids. More often than not, they may have learned not to stand up for themselves. They have learned not to call the other parent out on their bad behavior. They may act as an apologist. It's not them, it's their illness. It's not them, it's their anxiety. It's not them, they're just under a lot of stress at the moment. They may blame others for their narcissistic parents' bad behavior. They may even blame the children for misbehaving. They either don't question or they accept without question the narcissistic parent's version of reality. They may even spend a lot of time and a lot of energy trying to pacify others, cleaning up that narcissist's mess. So they're really acting like peacekeepers. Whatever it takes for a quiet life, when in reality, when they're doing this, what they're doing is they're showing that narcissistic parent there are no consequences to how they behave. So what does it make an enabler? Well, there are many different things. Some may see themselves as caregivers. They may see themselves as rescuers. The narcissistic parent may some have some kind of illness, some kind of mental health problem going on. They um, they may say that it's not them, it's their trauma, it's, it's how they were brought up, it's the difficulty that they're going through, it's their anxiety. They may fear the other parent, either fear the physical or the emotional abuse themselves. So they're spending a lot of time trying to keep that narcissistic partner happy. They may put themselves between the narcissistic parent and the children. They think they're protecting the children. They're taking a lot of flack. But in reality, what they're doing is the children are seeing them being abused, seeing them take the grief, seeing them being consistently hurt and rejected. Sometimes they might just be a, a very passive soul. They don't like conflict. They don't like to cause distress. They don't like to see upheaval. Quite commonly though, what you see is someone who's maybe been brainwashed, brainwashed over a period of time into perhaps believing they are the problem. I cause them to be like this. It's because of me. They take it out on the kids. I am the selfish one. If I try harder, they'll be good to us. They may even be deluded 
into thinking that narcissistic partner is a really good catch and they just have to work harder to deserve them. Now in cases where perhaps the enabler is one of the children, say the golden child for example, that child has maybe become so enmeshed with the narcissistic parent, they actually believe the other parent is the problem. So they spend a lot of time trying to compensate for the narcissistic parent's disappointment. What you see then is the child or the children as well as the parent doing everything they can to keep the narcissist happy, to keep them pleased. And this is like a win-win for the narcissist because everybody has now made them the centre of the universe. Now the enabling parent may also recognise it is not a healthy place to be. It is unhealthy for them. It is unhealthy for the children. It's a very toxic relationship. It's a very toxic family dynamic. But they may be financially dependent on the narcissist. They, they may only stay to act as a buffer between them and the children. Maybe they don't want to put the kids through the upheaval of a separation, a divorce. They don't want to put them through a terrible custody battle. So again, they're staying because they're thinking it is in the best interest of the children. They may fear the other parent alienating them against the children if they were to leave. And in reality, in a lot of cases, the kids are already being alienated against them. They see the narcissistic parent has no respect or regard for them and they're getting away with doing whatever they want. And over time, their respect for that parent starts to become eroded. The enabling parent may be trauma bonded to the narcissist. Now, sometimes this can look like an intense loyalty to the very person who's abusive to them. What's often going on though is the enabler has learned to avoid rage, upset, rejection, the, the awful illnesses, the insults, the drama, and they're doing it through constantly appeasing, using sex, money, praise, obedience. They're kind of seeing that relationship like an emotional roller coaster, a roller coaster of both positive and negative reinforcement. And they're behaving in a way not just to try and gain the positive, but they're doing it in a way that they're trying to mitigate the negative. Now, sometimes there can also be what's known as closet narcissism. Now, this is when, say, the enabling parent, there are a lot of narcissistic traits and qualities there, but it's not themselves they worship. It is the other person. And where we see closet narcissism, sometimes, sometimes that person cannot hold in their head the thought of the other person, that person they worship, even so much as doing or thinking something wrong. They worship that other person. They worship them. They, and this is why I often call it as a cult. Um, they, follow, they follow all the orders, all the beliefs, all the little signals. They follow it without question because the other person is always going to be right. They could also be, say, covert narcissists themselves. Uh, now, whether it's through intent or through neglect, because they're so self-absorbed, they, they are abusing and hurting the kids through the other parent. You know, the threat of that other parent's rage, that unkind humour. Now, a covert narcissist in a relationship with a grandiose narcissist, now, they could be both impressed by and fear the other partner. Their, their self-esteem is being fed by basking in the glory of their grandiosity. Or their self-esteem is being fed as being seen as the long-suffering partner. No matter what they do, it's never enough. They are so hard done by, so put upon. And in cases like that, and this sounds strange, but in cases like that, both narcissists are feeding off each other. They are enabling each other. One gets to glory in that sense of victimhood. The other one gets to glory in that sense of domination and control. But where we see cases like that, both are neglecting the kids. Um, they're either overlooking or they're just outright supporting each other's toxic behaviour towards the kids. They're overlooking the kids' needs. The kids can grow up in a state of insecurity, um, fearing the wrath of one parent, but also fearing the guilt tripping from the other. Their own needs have never been met. And lastly, I'd like to talk about some of the more common phrases that enablers use. They use them to the kids. Even when the kids are adults, they would still be using them. They would use them to others in general to allow that neglect, that controlling behaviour, that toxicity to continue. Now, you might not hear these things word for word, but here they are, and in no particular order, the first one is, they didn't mean it. 
Um, now that could be like it, it was only a joke. Um, that was their illness talking. That's their anxiety. They are under a lot of stress. They mean well. Whatever it was, it was for your own good. Second one. You hurt them. Look at what you did to cause that. What you did, what you said caused them great upset. What they're really doing is they are distracting from the distress and the pain of the children. They're shifting the blame onto the children for how the children were treated. Number three, and I think these are the most invalidating of all the phrases. You're exaggerating. I didn't see that. Therefore, it didn't happen. Um, that's not like them. That's not their character. Um, I don't accept that or I don't understand. Why do you make all this stuff up? Now, I think when they're invalidating children like that, what they're really saying is, I'm choosing not to acknowledge the pain you're in or I'm choosing not to acknowledge it just for the sake of a quiet life. Number four, they've had a hard time. They have trauma. They've been through a lot. Look at the pain they're in. Their mum and dad was hard on them. Again, it's excusing toxic behaviour. It's a way of trying to get the kids, I suppose, to feel sorry for their abuser. Next one, you should be grateful. They're trying their hardest. They love you. They only want what's best for you. After all they've done for you, why do you have to be so difficult? Why are you so selfish? Again, it's a way of shaming the children into feeling bad about feeling bad. Next one, suck it up. Don't be such a wimp. Stop being so sensitive. Again, what we're looking at is devaluing and minimizing the pain of the children. It's conditioning the kids to believe there's something wrong with them for not being okay with being abused. And lastly, and I have to say this is the one I've heard many times in many different situations and relationships, just do as you're told. Just give them what they want. I will suffer if you don't. I'm the one who gets it in the neck when you behave like that. It's emotional blackmail to the children. It's leading the children, even when they're adults, leading them to believe that they are responsible for how that parent gets treated by the narcissist. When the truth is, no, they're not. It's up to that enabler. It's up to that parent themselves to assert themselves, to manage their own boundaries. So that's a very generalized outline of an enabler in a narcissistic family. Now, there are many other types, many different behaviors, characteristics. So please feel free to use the comment box below if there's anything you'd like to share. These videos have been generating some interesting conversations lately. Now, if you like this video, if you find it helpful, please consider subscribing to my channel for future updates on mental health related topics. And until next time, thanks for watching.